Hey, Forty Sue here. Take a seat, make yourself comfortable, breathe in the sandalwood incense. I'm about to do a psychic reading of your personality. I'm getting the sense that you place a lot of value on being liked and admired. At times you can be excessively critical of yourself. You pride yourself on being an independent thinker and you rarely accept things without satisfactory proof. That'll be 200 pounds, please. Feel free to grab a handmade potion mm -hmm. on your way out. Oh, and if you could just leave a review on TripAdvisor, I'd really appreciate it. Even if you're not the type of person likely to visit a psychic, you probably saw at least something of yourself in one of those questions. That's because they're Barnum statements, declarations that appear to be unique insights into someone's character when really they could apply to pretty much anyone. The Barnum effect, also known as the Fora effect, or the reason your auntie Madge insists on reading out your horoscope every Friday, is a tried and tested technique used by unscrupulous mystics. It'll convince you they can see into your soul, reveal the path before you, and that you don't really need all that money in your wallet. Unsurprisingly, the most effective ones tend to be quite positive, like the ones you just heard. Mystics who come out with statements like, you're a bit of a wanker really, aren't you? Don't tend to get much repeat business. As you've probably guessed by now, the technique took its name from one of the most successful hoodwinkers in history, Phineas Taylor Barnum. You might know him as the creator of the traveling circus, The Greatest Show on Earth, the best-selling author of The Art of Money Getting, and the lead character of Hollywood blockbuster, The Greatest Showman. But Barnum didn't embrace circus life until the latter part of his career, and although his methods of acquiring money were indeed artful, he wasn't always the lovable hero portrayed by Hugh Jackman in the hit musical. One thing's for certain though, he made his fortune by performing some spectacularly scandalous hoaxes, none of which were more spectacular or scandalous than the so-called Fiji Mermaid. In July 1842, an English gentleman by the name of Dr. J. Griffin, said to be from the British Lyceum of Natural History, checked into a New York hotel. The press were expecting him, because throughout the summer they'd been bombarded with letters from people claiming to have met him and to have seen some of his truly astonishing creatures, including a particularly impressive mermaid. The press were of course desperate to get a look at this mythical specimen and Dr. Griffin, being the amiable fellow that he was, obliged. Now, you have to remember, this was a time when our knowledge of the natural world was extremely limited. The idea that mermaids might be real was certainly outlandish, but not quite beyond the realms of possibility especially considering the fact that Dr. Griffin's collection included stuffed remains of several other creatures that seemed just as bizarre, including an example of one of Mother Nature's biggest practical jokes, the duck-billed platypus. Around this time, Barnum was in the process of transforming a rundown museum on Broadway into Barnum's American Museum. Hold on a second. Is it just me, or does that shop next door say, importers of human hair? Anyway, back to the museum. It wasn't the kind of dull, musty place kids get dragged around on school trips. It featured more than 850,000 peculiar oddities, including a flea circus, and a loom powered by a dog. And naturally, Barnum decided that the mermaid was a must-have addition to his sprawling collection. Unfortunately, Dr. Griffin was less than convinced, and the two had a very public argument over the matter. Barnum appealed to Dr. Griffin's compassion by saying he'd already created publicity materials, drawings which depicted the mermaid as a seductive ocean maiden the kind we'd recognise today from the tales of William Shakespeare, Hans Christian Andersen, and Walt Disney. 
When Dr. Griffin refused to give in, Barnum handed the drawings over to the New York press, who promptly released them. Before long, the mermaid was the hot topic on everyone's lips, and with anticipation at an all-time high, Dr. Griffin caved in and agreed to exhibit it for a week at Concert Hall on Broadway. Accompanied by lectures on his theories of natural history and evidence demonstrating that the mermaid was authentic. Once that week was up, he agreed to let Barnum feature the mermaid in his museum. Unsurprisingly, Barnum's ticket sales went through the roof, but when the public finally cast their eyes on the mermaid, they were astonished. They'd hoped to see the captivating nymph-like creature published by the press, but this mermaid was as dead as a doornail and utterly grotesque. It had a shriveled tail, pendulous breasts, and its top half was completely covered in hair. It was around three feet long, and its mouth was held wide open as though it had died in pain. In a nutshell, only those with extremely niche tastes would ever want to be seduced by it. But this was only the first of many surprises. It came to light that the esteemed Dr. Griffin had never actually existed. The man parading as Dr. Griffin was actually Levi Lyman one of Barnum's best mates, and the whole affair, the letters that had appeared in the papers, the apparent spat between Griffin and Barnum, was all a carefully orchestrated scam designed to build up hype around the mermaid. As for the mermaid itself, you guessed it, it was a simple fake, the torso of a monkey sewn to the tail of a fish. It had originally been created by Japanese fishermen, as a joke, albeit a bit of a weird one, an American sea captain had, for reasons that are totally beyond me, bought this disturbing piece for a whopping $6,000 and exhibited it in a London coffee house. Until word got out that it was a fraud, after which it was transported to America. What's more, Barnum knew the mermaid wasn't legitimate before he exhibited it as he'd already paid a naturalist to examine it. It's the kind of hoax that stirs an uncomfortable mixture of begrudging respect and total repulsion. It's easy to see how Barnum landed his reputation as a marketing extraordinaire, but putting so much effort in to deceive his patrons in order to line his own pockets was a dick move by all accounts. Barnum's complex relationship with the truth can be traced back to his childhood. He was born in 1810 in Connecticut to Philo Barnum, an innkeeper and farmer, and his wife Irene Taylor. Young Barnum had high hopes for his future because, from the age of six, his grandfather had promised him he would inherit the most valuable piece of land in town, Ivy Island. Barnum grew up fantasizing about his prosperous future and all the things he would do with the land when he finally inherited it. When Barnum turned 12, he was finally allowed to see his inheritance with his own eyes for the very first time. With great ceremony, his grandfather, along with friends and family, took a trip to Ivy Island. But when the group arrived, Barnum's companions burst out laughing. You see, this grand inheritance, the most coveted spot of land in town, was nothing more than a dirty, empty swamp. The whole thing had been a six-year-long joke at Barnum's expense. You might expect such a cruel revelation would do some serious psychological damage to a boy of 12, or at least upset him a bit. But Barnum took the whole thing surprisingly well, and after a few seconds of shock, he was laughing along with everyone else. Which might go some way towards explaining the peculiar attitude towards deception that would later come to define his career. Although Barnum wouldn't actually call it deception, he preferred the term humbug, meaning a bit of elaborate fun. In Barnum's mind, as long as people felt they were getting their money's worth, it was no harm, no foul. 
The key thing was to give them an unforgettable experience that would leave them satisfied. In his own words, the noblest art is that of making others happy. But it seems that for Barnum, some people's happiness was worth more than others, and his attempts to profit from it weren't exactly noble. As a young man, he'd flexed his industrial muscles by selling Bibles, running a grocery store, and starting his own newspaper. But he took his first dip into showmanship at the age of 25, after he came across a woman called Joyce Heff. At the time, Heff was held as a slave by the promoter R.W. Lindsay, who claimed she was the childhood nurse of George Washington. Which in itself would have been quite interesting, but was even more so when you considered the fact that Washington had been born 103 years previous, making Joyce incredibly old. Unfortunately, because of those pesky anti-slavery laws in New York and Pennsylvania, Barnum couldn't buy her. But being the determined young man that he was, he found a loophole which meant he could lease her for a year. He began promoting Hef as the most astonishing and interesting curiosity in the world. A 161-year-old woman who could tell stories about what it was like to raise the founding father of the United States of America. Hef was not in a good way at the time. She was blind, toothless, had arthritis in her hands, and was nearly completely paralyzed. But despite this, Barnum took her by carriage and train to tour dozens of towns in the Northeast, where she was put on display six days a week, sometimes up to 12 hours a day. And just in case some people weren't that impressed by a woman who defied death, Barnum stirred up the hype even further by announcing she wasn't human at all, but a curiously constructed automaton controlled by a ventriloquist. Yeah, at this point, you really have to wonder if he was just taking the piss. Barnum's lease agreement was cut short when Hef died in February 1836, after 10 months in Barnum's care. But the showman had one last trick up his sleeve. There had, quite understandably, been plenty of skepticism about Joyce's immense age, so Barnum declared he would prove it once and for all by hosting a public autopsy of her body. It was not to put too fine a point on it, a pretty despicable stunt, even by Barnum's standards. Not content with having exploited this poor woman in life, he was now going to eke whatever remaining profit he could out of her cold, dead body. But as always, P.T. Barnum knew his audience. The announcement of the autopsy created a media storm, and more than 1,500 tickets were sold. On the big day, crowds flocked to watch the well-known surgeon, Dr. David Rogers, dissect Hef's body. His autopsy revealed that, surprise, surprise, she was somewhere between 75 and 80 years old at the time of her death. The papers had a field day, but Barnum rode it out like a pro, first suggesting he'd been tricked all along, and then that the autopsy must have taken place on the wrong body, because the real Joyce Hef was still alive and well, enjoying a tour of Europe. The public didn't seem to mind either way, or if they did, not enough to hinder Barnum's career, because Joyce Hef was, in many ways, the launch pad for his fame. A few years later, Barnum had saved up enough money to open his museum, and boy did he know how to make an entrance. He added a lighthouse lamp to attract attention up and down Broadway, placed giant paintings of animals between the upper windows, and transformed the roof into a strolling garden, which also served as a base for daily hot air balloon rides. Because why the hell not? Some of the first curiosities to feature in his museum included wax statues of celebrities and what was apparently a genuine Cyclops retina. But it was his so-called freak show that really kicked things off. In 1842, Barnum met Charlie Stratton, who was just 25 inches tall. Barnum presented him as an 11-year-old when he was actually four or five, 
pretended he was from England, when in fact he was American, and gave him the name General Tom Thumb. Barnum also taught him to sing, dance, and imitate celebrities, before taking him on a grand tour of Europe. During the tour, Stratton met Queen Victoria, mesmerising her royal highness by having a ceremonial sword battle with her spaniel. And if something about that makes you feel a little uncomfortable, you're not alone. Later that night, Queen Victoria wrote in her diary that she pitied the young performer, suspecting he was teased by his peers, and wished he could be properly cared for. So even Queen Vic, who wasn't exactly known for her compassion, felt that something was a bit off. In 1853, Barnum added one of his most popular exhibitions to date, Josephine Clofulia, also known as Madame Clofulia. She liked to fashion her most notable asset, a six-inch beard in the style of Napoleon III, first president of France, who was flattered enough to give her a large diamond in return. Unfortunately for the bearded lady, her fame resulted in one of Barnum's patrons suing her on the grounds that she was just a man in a dress. Madame Clafulia was put through the humiliation of a medical examination to settle the case one way or another, and was found to be a woman in every sense of the word, even if she was in need of a shave. The headlines drew in even more crowds, which is probably no coincidence, since it was later discovered that Barnum had once again carefully orchestrated the publicity by paying the plaintiff <laughs> to instigate the lawsuit. You've probably gathered by now that Barnum's mantra was go big or go home. He once attempted to buy the American Falls section of Niagara Falls and fence it off so he could charge admission. He tried to buy the ruins of Pompeii, but couldn't strike a deal with the Italian government. And he even made an offer on the cottage where William Shakespeare was born, which he wanted to uproot and transfer to New York. Thankfully, he was outbid by the Shakespeare Association. In the summer of 1865, Barnum's museum caught fire and burnt to the ground. Miraculously, no human lives were lost but the fire destroyed the Fiji mermaid and tragically boiled two beluga whales alive in their tanks. Some of the other animals escaped, although the rumors of a lion taking a leisurely stroll through the streets of New York were apparently false. The fire came as a big blow to Barnum, but the show must go on. And so, in need of a change of direction, he did what any wealthy person with questionable morals would do. He went into politics. He was elected to the Connecticut legislature and, without a hint of irony, began campaigning for black equality and voting rights. This was an odd direction for him to take for several reasons. As well as exploiting the slave Joyce Heff, Barnum had owned slaves whilst living in the South and had exhibited the black man, William Henry Johnson, also known as Zip the Pinhead, as a half man, half monkey who'd been found in the wilds of Africa. Yeah. Years later, Barnum ran for Congress as a Republican against his Democrat cousin, William Barnum. Whilst he was running, he expressed deep remorse for his past behavior, but it's difficult to know whether this was just another humbug to win over the crowds. After losing the seat to his cousin, Barnum went for a bit of a rough patch. His second museum caught fire, and a few years later, his wife of 40 years died. He apparently wasn't that devastated though, because he remarried three months after the funeral to a 23-year-old woman named Nancy Fish. He was 63 at the time. In 1881, Barnum's luck turned when he met James Bailey. At the time, Barnum was touring with P.T. Barnum's Grand Travelling Museum, Menagerie, Caravan and Hippodrome, which he rebranded with the slightly snappier title, The Greatest Show on Earth. Meanwhile, James Bailey was operating the Cooper and Bailey Circus with James Cooper. This rival circus was pretty good. So good, in fact, it was threatening to demote Barnum's to the second greatest show on earth. 
the star attraction of the Cooper and Bailey Circus was the first elephant born in the United States. When Barnum offered to buy the elephant, Bailey and Cooper refused, but they eventually agreed to join with Barnum to form the giant free-ringed Barnum and Bailey Circus in 1881. The next year, Barnum finally got his revenge on the Brits for neglecting to sell him Shakespeare's house by purchasing Jumbo, a gargantuan six-ton African elephant from the London Zoological Society, despite a series of public protests. He billed it as the largest elephant ever seen and made it the centerpiece of his circus. Aside from being enormous, Jumbo had a few tricks up his sleeve. He reportedly loved beer and could down a full keg in a single sitting, and he was even used to test the stability of the newly constructed Brooklyn Bridge, along with 20 other elephants and 17 camels. By the way, Jumbo didn't get his name by virtue of his extreme size, as you've probably assumed. In fact, the word Jumbo, meaning very large, entered the English language because of this very elephant. Unfortunately, Jumbo's circus life was short-lived, and he was killed after being struck by a freight train following a performance. Never one to miss the opportunity to make a quick book, Barnum sold various bits of Jumbo to museums and universities around the country before stuffing the elephant's hide so he could display it at his circus. Eventually, Barnum donated the stuffed Jumbo to Tufts University, where it remained until it was destroyed in yet another fire. In his 81st year, Barnum fell gravely ill, and sensing the Reaper was on his doorstep, he asked the Evening Sun to publish his obituary in advance so he could read it. Two weeks later, he died from a stroke in his Bridgeport mansion. The Barnum and Bailey Circus continued touring in some form or other until as recently as 2017, establishing itself as a cornerstone of American culture. And to this day, Barnum is still known as the greatest impresario of all time and a glittering example of the American dream. He was also prone to being a bit of a douchebag with some questionable morals, but if the Prince of Humbugs taught us anything, it's this. Whether it's an ugly mermaid, a false past, or a so-called reality show that's actually scripted, we'll all forgive a bit of hokum, as long as we've been entertained. Thanks for watching. Check out my new podcast, Random Interesting Facts, available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Link in the description below. Thanks.